सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली एक्सीडेंटल डेथ द बंगाल एडवोकेट जनरल कंक्लूडेड द इंग्लिश कॉलोनियल प्लांटर हु शॉट डेड हिज सर्वेंट फकीरा at bhagwanpur one morning in 1841 claimed to have been aiming his shotgun at a herd of sheep 30 eyewitnesses though said there were no sheep to be seen case closed the unsatisfactory manner in which this case was disposed of the east india company's court of directors observed affords an additional instance of the urgent want of tribunals for the trials of british born subjects in the mufassil earlier this month the central government proposed replacements for the indian penal code of 1860 and the code of criminal procedure passed the next year among the first three laws ever enacted by the colonial government and a consequence of the chaos the fakira case pointed to The proposed decolonization of Indian law though is somewhat less dramatic than advertised careful analysis shows even though the new codes include several welcome measures to modernize the criminal justice system the legal reforms do not address the darkest colonial shadow over the law enforcement system in India and that's the police like fakira millions of indians remain victims of a criminal justice system founded on inequality even though legal reforms after independence removed racial bias and promised equality under the penal codes justice has remained out of reach for swathes of the population like women dalits the poor religious minorities you can go on and on long complex discussions lie ahead as the new criminal laws make their way to a standing committee of parliament and then to a vote law enforcement officials have sought many of the changes proposed in these reforms for years the bharatiya nyay sanhita bill which seeks to replace the indian penal code brings terrorism for example into the core body of criminal law instead of leaving it to special legislation like the uapa The bill also allows for the punishment of organized crime which is now addressed by multiple state level laws like that of Maharashtra. The bill mandates that police be allowed to handcuff certain criminals in certain circumstances, a practice which was curbed by the Supreme Court in 1979 and has then become a huge subject of confusion. Law enforcement experts have argued that the regulated use of restraints in line with global best practice will in addition to protecting the police from violent criminals protect suspects at risk of being shot dead in cold blood in so called encounter attempts for its part the bharatiya saksha bill which replaces the evidence act of 1872 includes modern provisions for electronic evidence Law enforcement officials and the high courts have long pressed for laws to replace the outdated section 65B of the Evidence Act which now deals with this issue. The new bill also proposes allowing for online services of summons and examination of witnesses. Even though the new laws have generated criticism, analysis suggests much of their content is in fact similar to the colonial era legislation they replace. Four fifths of the Bharatiya Nyay Sanhita, lawyer Tarun Khetan has shown, using a plagiarism checking software, is forged pretty much word for word from the old penal code. This was also observed during Khetan's analysis of the new code of procedure, the Bharatiya Nagrik Suraksha Sanhita, as well as the Bharatiya Saksha Bill. Former Border Security Force Director General Prakash Singh, one of the leading voices for police reform in india has also advocated that the new laws 
retain the earlier numbering for offences like murder, everyone knows 302 or fraud 420 to avoid confusion among investigators and prosecutors. Many experts also worry that this apparently unnecessary renumbering process will set back decades long work on India's searchable online criminal database, the Crime and Criminal Tracking Network System. Imagine the horror of having to search for sections of law before and after a certain date with completely different numbers. Legal reform, most important, isn't the same thing as criminal justice reform. And the history of the laws the bill seeks to replace helps us understand just why that is. Early in the 19th century, the East India Company governed Indians and English residents through different sets of laws. King's courts, as they were called in the presidencies, used English judges and English lawyers to administer English law. Far from the company's coastal centres of power though, its courts administered a complex maze of traditional Hindu and Muslim customary law. Even as late as 1789, Islamic criminal law, including the mutilation and amputation of criminals, was being followed in some parts of Bengal. Governor General Warren Hastings had, in 1773, set aside a distinct space for religious personal laws. But it became pretty clear that the secular sphere of criminal law needed some kind of uniform regulation, even if personal laws didn't. Following the end of the company's monopoly in 1813, growing numbers of Europeans, independent of its discipline, of its employment, began to arrive in India. European planters and settlers found themselves in direct conflict with Indians for the first time. And the resentment this fostered challenged the company's desire to control its territories. The company, historian Elizabeth Klosky has noted, had no squeamishness about using brutal force against Indians. But the experience of the American Revolution taught that injustice could engender violent backlash. And the company was wary about the emerging challenge to its monopoly of force. Late in 1824, a Dhaka judge warned the directors of the company of, and I quote, a class of persons very common in this district and who are emphatically designated latels or bludgeon men. He wrote that gangs funded by European indigo planters were using violence and again I quote to enforce payment of outstanding balances from the ryots and secure and hold in lien their crops, but not infrequently to lay hold of and carry off the produce of neighbouring cultivators. Thomas Babington Macaulay, who of course you'll have heard of, set sail for India in 1833, charged with what he described as the, I'll quote again, momentous task of codifying the law of India, creating in great and entire work symmetrical in all its parts and spirit. Well, that's not exactly what happened. Europeans, in fact, retained many of their privileges. The Criminal Procedure Code of 1861, for example, gave special privileges to European-born British subjects, like the right to be tried by a white majority jury and a British judge. The principle of racial inequality deepened in 1872 when Indian magistrates were expressly barred from trying European-born British. The nationalist movement scholar Brinalini Sinha has recorded was born from struggles to end white impunity. The growing racism of late Victorian society provoked anger among Indians. The case of the English manager of the Rangmati tea estate who evaded prosecution for rape in 1888 by pleading guilty to adultery was one of many which illustrated the absurdity of racialized justice. There were sharp battles too, historian Judith Whitehead has written, over perceived encroachments of criminal law into Hindu tradition, like the 1891 amendment of the Indian Penal Code to raise the age of consent for girls from 10 to 12. Even as late as 1923, when the Criminal Procedure Code and other laws were amended to remove racial discrimination in trials, 
English liberalism proved unable to deliver on the full promise of equality. The government's efforts to decolonize Indian criminal justice will not account for much unless it addresses the machine that enforced those laws during colonial rule. The Police Act of 1861 made Indian law enforcement dangerously subservient to the political executive and no government has tried seriously to address this problem. Even though 17 states have passed new police acts to replace the colonial legislation, not one has fully met Supreme Court benchmarks for insulating appointments and tenure from political interference. And of course, if appointments and tenure aren't impartial, no force can be. Even before colonial authorities created a new legal framework for criminal justice, the rudiments of an imperial police force to implement it were already being built. And some of it will sound strangely familiar even today. From 1793, under Governor General Charles Cornwallis, the East India Company started seizing responsibility for law and order from zamindars and handed it to police stations. The new police station chiefs or darogas, the civil servant John Beams observed, served the empire by being close to the people and their own interests by being even closer to criminals. They ruled their territories like little kings, Beams recorded. Their misdeeds were legion and always went unpunished. English law in India, not surprisingly, had little to say about police accountability. The new penal codes don't either. Following the rebellion of 1857, historian Erin Giuliani has written, imperial administrators were convinced of the need for more effective policing, but they didn't want to pay the bill. There were just 532 enrolled police officers for all of Bhagalpur in 1862, she found. Each one was responsible on an average for a staggering 3,740 people. The paucity of personnel and training meant that violence was the main tool for solving crime, recovering stolen goods and suppressing dissent. An investigation of the company's police system in the Madras presidency conducted in 1885 reported that, I quote, corruption and bribery reign paramount through the whole establishment. Violence, torture and cruelty are their chief instruments for detecting crime. Even today, little has changed. Figures published by the Bureau of Police Research and Development show that Indian police forces are on average about 20% short of the number of personnel governments themselves say are necessary. Bihar has just 76 personnel for every 1 lakh people. It's actually worse than the colonial era. And Uttar Pradesh has 133 instead of the required 183. The use of modern investigative technology as well as training standards remains poor. There are no consistent standards, public policy expert Sonal Marwa has written, and most training facilities lack basic amenities and sufficient instructors. Forget fighting terrorists, most rank-and-file police officers won't have an opportunity to even engage in basic firearms, tactics and training for most of their career. Prime Minister Narendra Modi's commitment to rid Indian criminal law of the last ink stains left behind by Macaulay can't be faulted. To give these reforms any real meaning though, he must also reform the police the empire authored with that ink. I'm Praveen Swami and I'm National Security Editor of The Print. Thank you again for watching Security Code.